Morocco recognized the United States in 1777. It was a actually the first country to recognize uh, the new country of the United States. Uh, and it has been close in the last 200 years. Hello and welcome to Insights from Abroad. This podcast is part of the Middle East and South Asia Initiative in the College of Sciences at the University of Central Florida. My name is Jeffrey Pelegas. Our mission here is to educate, engage, and influence the international community. Today, I am joined by Edward Gabriel, former ambassador to Morocco, to discuss some of our topics surrounding our North Africa series. Ambassador Gabriel, thank you for being here. It's good to be with you, Jeffrey. Edward Gabriel was ambassador to Morocco from 1997 to 2001. He is a member of the Global Advisory Board at George Washington University and a senior counselor at the Center for Democracy. He has been a distinguished leader of many different professional and nonprofit organizations and is an Ellis Island Medal of Honor Award recipient. He has advised on many different policy issues, including energy and the environment, national security, trade issues, nuclear nonproliferation, and Middle East policy matters. He is a founding member of the American Task Force for Lebanon and is currently the head of the Moroccan American Center in Washington, D.C. And so let's, let's talk some more about the American Task Force for Lebanon. We touched on it briefly in the beginning, but what else can you tell me about ATFL? Sure. Um, the American Task Force for Lebanon was started 30 years ago uh, by a group of prominent Americans of Lebanese heritage with the uh, purpose to bring closer relations and understanding between the country of Lebanon and the United States. Uh, we're an organization made up of uh, prominent Lebanese. You've heard some of the names in the past, Casey Kasem, oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, Danny Thomas, awesome. George Mitch, Senator George Mitchell, Ambassador Philip Habib, the list goes on. Okay. Uh, so they were very influential in helping the organization get started. And uh, we have been trying to educate America, mainly Congress and uh, presidential administrations and other policymakers on uh, the importance of Lebanon to America. We're also involved in trying to explain to the Lebanese government uh, America's priorities and how they can be a better partner and a continuing partner with the United States. So kind of this inter intermediary role between interests, trying to find common ground. Exactly. Awesome. And an educational role as well. Can you tell me a little bit about the Moroccan American Center in Washington, D.C.? Yeah, again, um, I'm the head of uh, both organizations. Um, I was here this week with my colleague Jean Abinader, uh, who uh, works with me both in the American Task Force for Lebanon and the Moroccan American Center in Washington. The Moroccan American Center was um, started as an organization to represent the interests of Morocco in the United States. And it has evolved over time into a, a nonprofit 501c3 organization for the purpose, uh, very much like uh, ATFL, uh, the purpose being to help uh, bring better understanding between the country of Morocco and the United States. Uh, in the past, we are much more actively involved in actually pushing for U.S. policies to be supportive of uh, Moroccan initiatives and to help Morocco understand what they needed to do to be more responsive to the United States. Uh, now we uh, do a lot of writing, we conduct workshops, and we have other kinds of forums in which we try to bring a better understanding between the two sides. So can maybe you can speak to some of the challenges and maybe strengths between the Moroccan and American relationship as far as Yeah, well, you know, the, you know, I can't uh, do a podcast without saying that <laughs> it's the oldest relationship uh, with the United States. Um, Morocco recognized the United States in 1777. Wow. Um, yeah. It was a actually the first country to recognize uh, the new country of the United States. Uh, and it has been close in the last 200 years, 200 plus years, in many different ways. Counterterrorism, uh, they're working very closely with the United States on it. And military uh, arrangements, the largest African exercise between the United States is with the United States is with Morocco. 
Uh, so there's a, a great and strong military relationship. And also the monarchs of Morocco have always been close to and had a preferential relationship with the United States. In 1787, I believe, the United States brought a treaty of friendship to King uh, Sultan Mohammed III um, to establish a treaty of trade and friendship. And in uh, George Washington's letter of thanks for helping them with the Barbary pirates and also in, in establishing this trade relationship, uh, the president, our first president, George Washington, said, within our borders there are no mines of gold or silver, and this young nation, just recovering from a war of desolation and waste, has not yet found the means by agriculture and commerce to be helpful to its friends. But we flatter ourselves one day that, to be helpful. And that was the United States talking to Morocco wow. in those days, so you can imagine. Uh, so uh, bring it forward to the present day, and it's, uh, we, they have one of the uh, 20, uh, we only have 20 free trade agreements in, in the world, the oh. United States, and Morocco has one of them, oh. which creates a, a tremendous gateway for the United States in industry to come through Morocco as a gateway to Africa. And Morocco has a great interest to uh, give preferential treatment to American companies in that regard. Wow, that's an incredible story. I didn't realize the the long term history there, and the you know I don't think I've ever heard of a treaty of friendship before, right? <laughs> yeah, it's the longest um, existing treaty that has never been broken. Wow, that's amazing. That takes a lot of hard work and dedication yeah. for sure. So let me ask you about uh, maybe changes in the Moroccan economy. So I know that there have been increases in manufacturing in the region and so maybe you can speak to some of that and and how those how those forces are in shaping the whole region not just Morocco. Yeah, my my colleague Jean Abinader on the way over here told me that uh, in industrial manufacturing makes up about 15 to 20 percent of the uh, manufacturing of the economy in Morocco that was nearly zero um, two decades ago before King Mohammed um, took the reins of his country, uh, and it was mainly in textiles. So agriculture was over 20% of their GDP years ago. It's down to 15% now. It's mostly rain-fed agriculture that it's dependent on. So this increase in manufacturing has been very, very important. The king has really emphasized trade agreements. Uh, he has a number of them around the world, and uh, especially preferential treatment, I, like I said, with American companies, Boeing is there. Um, they have a huge car manufacturing facilities between Casablanca and Tangier. Uh, they're now the largest manufacturer of cars in Africa. They are also in, in technology issues. They're producing carbon fiber parts for solar and wind and, and for Boeing aircraft. So uh, it's really taken off. It's a big challenge, though. Um, they need a 5-plus percent growth rate to keep up with their population and to bring it, you know, bring the standard of living of its people up. And that still is a big challenge for the country. So regardless of how well the king is doing to bring his country along, it still has big challenges ahead in terms of uh, job creation for its people. Right. And so we've spoken to some of the kind of better parts of the relationship. What are some of the challenges that exist between U.S. and Morocco? Well, I think the, the challenge between the United States and Morocco um, is the following. Um, America has, has an interest with um, second-tier countries, okay, outside of Russia and France and Great Britain, you know, those first-tier countries. With that next tier that Morocco's in, it really, its primary interest usually is to get support from Morocco for multilateral issues or regional issues. Help us on the peace process. Right. Uh, can you do something with Israel or uh, with the Arab leaders in the region to bring them closer to understanding something like that? Or help us at the UN on various international issues. Support us in various resolutions of the UN Security Council. So multilateral regional kinds of issues we have for the most part. Morocco, on the other hand, has bilateral interests. And so Morocco cares about its most important existential issue being the Western Sahara. 
So to the extent that America is forward-leaning and supporting them on the Western Sahara, they'll get more support from Morocco. So um, I think that that's a challenge. Um, we have not been consistent with Morocco on the Western Sahara. We've said on the one hand, uh, we're going to support your sovereignty. We're going to guarantee your sovereignty. We've said this in private meetings that are now public through disclosed diplomatic notes that are now in the public domain. We got the king to agree to all this stuff. Then we don't follow through and implement. So that's a challenge. Um, we have uh, anti-terrorism issues that we're working very closely on with them. So that's not a problem, but that's a continuing discussion. So that's important for them. They have other issues with Europe, like migration issues that affect us secondarily. Uh, but I would say that that's kind of the number one issue between the two countries. Gotcha. And so let's jump back to this Sahara. So I was reading somewhere that you were kind of spearheaded the the work towards solving a dispute between Al Algeria and Morocco regarding the Western Sahara. Is that correct? Well, I obviously you read uh, some of the recent uh, <laughs> articles we've been writing because since this previously confidential memo was uh, disclosed by the State Department, you get to see firsthand what the truth of the matter is. I was not mediating between Algeria and Morocco. Instead, advising Morocco and the United States on how the United States could be more supportive of the Sahara issue. In that regard, the United States concluded uh, when I was ambassador that a referendum of the people is not going to solve anything. First of all, they couldn't figure out who should vote on a referendum because there were too many disagreements uh, in that regard. And if there was a vote, would it be 60-40, 70-30? Either way, how much disenfranchisement would you have with the remaining people? So it's not quite a way to do a winner-take-all referendum. Instead, uh, we believed, and Morocco now is very supportive and has shown a great initiative in this regard, to create an autonomy plan for the people living there under their sovereignty. So that's kind of a middle solution that we have advocated over the years. Morocco accepted. The UN is moving in that direction slowly. But like I said earlier, the United States made promises to go get that job done 20 years ago, mm. and they're still uh, not being forthcoming with Morocco. But I think I feel a sense of new urgency uh, in, in our government, and I hope that's the case in the coming years. And so can you tell us a little bit about the ATFL? Well, let me let me talk about Lebanon um, and, and, and the challenge it has and the challenge the United States has. The United States is very concerned about um, um, the organization, the group Hezbollah, which is not only, in our opinion, in America's opinion, a terrorist group, but in Lebanon they're viewed as part of the fabric of the country. Um, uh, they have uh, parliamentarians, uh, but they also have arms. And to a certain extent, outside of Lebanon, uh, accusations have been made and proven that they've been uh, in Yemen. What are they doing in Yemen? Um, and in other countries, South America and other countries where they have um, supported, they've been in, in Syria as well, uh, supporting Assad. So there's a question about how this um, uh, group, Hezbollah, which is part of the fabric of Lebanon, deals outside of the country and the threat it poses to um, some of our allies, including Israel. So that's a rub between the United States and Lebanon. What's important is that the American government understand that we have to be deft in our approach on how to handle Hezbollah. Some congressmen who don't understand the situation would say, well, tell Lebanon to kick them out or we'll cut them off. Um, right. And that's kind of a, I understand the feelings with that. But that won't cut them off, and that will only strengthen them by cutting off aid, especially military aid, to uh, the Lebanese armed forces. It, so in a deft approach, you would say, build up the Lebanese armed forces so that one day they're strong enough to assert their total sovereignty over the whole country and be able to curtail the activities of Hezbollah. So that's one issue, is supporting a strong Lebanese armed forces, and that's important. The Lebanese 
economies in in shambles quite frankly they're not even projecting a one percent growth rate or just about one mm. percent so they, they've got a lot of challenges and the international community with the united states involved has offered them 11 billion dollars uh, in infrastructure aid and also to deal with the 1.5 million refugees that have run from syria into their country but to do that they have to really enact policies that will strengthen rule of law, transparency, and how they deal in contracting and privatization issues. Uh, a lot of functions of government should be in the private sector, like electricity production and garbage pickup and things like that, that would help reduce the budget and make the budget more amenable. If Lebanon can do all these things, they're going to get $11 billion to begin a process. Uh, to rebuild their country. If they don't, they're going to be in trouble. So this year they need to show through a budgetary process that they can address this issue. The refugees are a, really a major problem. Think of it this way, uh, with over a million refugees, maybe approaching two million if you include Palestinian refugees, on a country of four plus million, mm. um, that's like all of Canada, in most of Mexico, being pushed into the United States in three years. Wow. Last year, we took nine Syrian refugees. Nine. Lebanon took over a million, probably 1.1, 1.2 million, and, and then so. Wow. So you can imagine the pressure on this country. Um, and the, the, you just can't handle it. The economy can't handle it. There are people in the streets, that, and they'll work for just cents. So they're pushing the Lebanese out of job. It's difficult. And as gracious as the Lebanese have been towards the refugees, they're starting to get to a point that they really would wish the international community would step in and help. The last thing I'll say is, in dealing with a lot of this problem, um, we have to deal with the Syrian problem. And, or, and that also addresses the Iranian problem. So Iran is in Lebanon with, with uh, money and materials to Hezbollah. We've got, a, uh, we've got an unstable Syria. So the United States has to step on, up and realize regionally, Lebanon can't do this job alone. It has to step in there and make sure that we're a player. Russia has taken the ground. Ceded, we ceded the ground to Russia and Syria, and we can't do that if we're going to as, uh, assert ourselves, uh, deal with uh, Iranian arms flowing across the region, and also make sure that Hezbollah puts down their arms uh, eventually. So uh, that's a, another big challenge. So that's kind of Lebanon in a nutshell. In that sense, we uh, we work very hard to bring that kind of understanding that I just described to the American government. Also, the banking sector is very strong in Lebanon, but terrorists use Lebanon to put their money through the banks. So we work very closely uh, with the United States government to say, well, don't kill Lebanon over the whole banking system. Uh, don't bring down the banking system over this. Instead, let's identify who the terrorists are and go after them individually. And to the extent that um, you can get the, the bank's help, perfect. And the banks jumped right in, uh, in a partnership, the Lebanese banks, and they're working very closely with our Treasury Department to weed out those characters. And so what do you think just average citizens like myself could do to either support or to help educate other people? What's the most important factor for the wide variety of people to know? I think that there are two great ethnic populations in America. One is the Lebanese. They're everywhere. Uh, case, and, case, and, case, and, case in point. <laughs> case in point. Uh, so they're everywhere in every state. Uh, they're prominent members of their community, either in government or business or academia. And um, the Moroccans, especially here in the Orlando, uh, Florida area, are huge population. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is those ethnic groups should be coming together uh, and I know you're trying to set up a Moroccan center right here we are, yes. on campus. 
I think that's the kind of thing that you could do, is to bring those citizens to bear on issues um, to bring better understanding between our two cultures, our two people, our two countries, in both cases, both in the Lebanese case and in the Moroccan. So to facilitate these discussions. Help facilitate citizens of those ethnic backgrounds to get more involved in community work in, in, in Orlando, for instance but also in trying to bring more understanding with the United States and uh, their home country. And so if someone was listening to our podcast today and wanted to reach out to you, is there, are you on social media? Is there a way to get in touch with we you? We are. Um, the American Task Force for Lebanon is atfl.org. Okay. atfl.org. And for the, the Moroccan American Center, 